Hey, welcome to the very first online worship weekend here at Calvary. Uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, due to the, the requests of our government officials, due to the protection of our, our uh, most vulnerable citizens, we're doing worship online uh, this weekend and uh, next weekend, and we don't know when it'll stop. Uh, and we're all praying it sooner rather than later. Uh, because none of us are really excited about being isolated. And can I just admit, uh, as I'm preaching to you, as I'm sharing with you, this is kind of awkward. At least it's awkward for me. Uh, I'm preaching to a room that is empty when I'm used to seeing hundreds of people who are excited to be here worshiping Jesus, uh, sharing life with one another. And, and this is a different kind of scenario that we're in, different kind of world that we're living in. And, uh, and, and yet, I'm, I'm excited. I hope you're worshiping with the loved ones, with your family, with your friends, uh, maybe with your life group, and just celebrating the goodness of God in all the ways it's manifest. Uh, you know, the last two weeks have kind of changed everything, haven't they? Uh, I mean, uh, who could have seen this coming? I know there were people who were watching it, who were predicting it, but most of us were not really ready for the unlikely turn of events that have happened, uh, you know, for for things being shut down and social distancing and isolation and, and, and trying to, to not gather in groups. Uh, it, it's really a different kind of world that we're living in right now. And, and it was unexpected on a lot of counts. It's awkward on a lot of counts. It's, it, it's difficult. And there's a lot of questions that we have. And, and as we're talking about these unlikely turns of events, these things we didn't see coming, uh, we're going to be kicking off a uh, a preaching series about Easter. Uh, it's called Unlikely Witnesses, and we're going to kind of look at some of the, the people that maybe you wouldn't think were a big part of the Easter story and talk about their lives and, and what they encountered. And, and some of you might be going, how does that relate to today? How is that relevant to the world we're living in with all of the chaos and uncertainty and changes that are happening seemingly by the minute, uh, if not by the day? And and yet that sums up exactly what took place in the Easter story. In the Easter story, you had a, a huge turn of events, a, a lot of unlikely circumstances and changes because you had Jesus coming into Jerusalem to the shouts of the, the masses who were celebrating him. You, you had uh, Jesus surprising everyone by, you know, cleansing the temple and turning over the tables of the money changers and chasing people out. You, you had uh, people questioning him and, and, and difficult in, in conflict, if you will. Uh, and, and then, of course, you had the, the quiet time with his disciples in a, you know, in a, an approved group size of 13. Uh, and then, of course, you had betrayal. You had arrest. You had trial. You had crucifixion. And, and then of the most unlikely of events, the resurrection. And, and so, really, we can learn a lot about how to deal with today and what we're going through by taking a look back at the most significant event in Christianity, and that is the Easter story. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 is, is going to be our text, where you're going to find our text. And, and uh, we're going to be talking about a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Now, uh, he's one of three prominent Josephs in the Bible. Now, you may not be able to name all three of them, but I'm going to give you a real quick update. First of all, you have Old Testament Joseph. Old Testament Joseph. Uh, his story is found in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. And Old Testament Joseph is the son of Jacob. He's one of 12 uh, boys that were born to the, the founder of Israel, the nation. And he's like the next to youngest, and he's got a big mouth, and he dreams dreams and has visions, and his brothers hate him, and so they sell him into slavery, uh, which is a step up from what they want to do, which was kill him. And, uh, and then in slavery, he rises to prominence in Egypt, becomes the number two most powerful person in Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world, and his brothers come to him asking for food. They don't know it's him. He could have killed them. He could have imprisoned him. He forgave them. It's a great story. That's not the one we're talking about. And then there's Christmas Joseph. Now, you guys know Christmas Joseph, or at least you're familiar with him. He was the, the husband of Mary, uh, Jesus' mom, so he was Jesus' stepfather. Uh, there's not a lot about him written in the Bible. You can, you can find his story in Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 2. Uh, just very little bit about him. Mostly we just know him as that figure in the nativity scene that's hovering over the manger doing nothing. So uh, that's uh, Christmas 
Joseph, and we're not talking about him either. We're talking about, if you will, Easter Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. So who is Joseph of Arimathea. Let's talk about him, but first of all, let's really read the passage where he's mentioned, which is Matthew chapter 27, uh, beginning at verse 57. Now, this is right after the crucifixion. So, Jesus is still on the cross. He's just died, uh, and and, uh, miracles have happened. Amazing things have happened, uh, and this is what it says, verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb." Uh, so who is Joseph of Arimathea? He's, he's one of the few people who is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all mention him. Uh, and he's one of the few people that's mentioned in all four that isn't an apostle or Jesus or, uh, you know, a prominent figure like Mary or one of the bad guys. So uh, here's what we know from Scripture, just a little bit about Joseph of Arimathea. First of all, we know that he's rich and powerful. Okay, he had money and he was politically connected. So he was part of the ruling council that called the Sanhedrin of Israel. They were the people in charge. There were 71 members of that council that, that oversaw the religious life of the nation, really uh, the life of the nation. They reported to the Romans. But uh, the Sanhedrin was the council that actually condemned Jesus to death and handed him over to Pilate. Now we know Joseph of Arimathea was against that decision, but we also know that he didn't speak up publicly against that decision. So he was rich and powerful. And then we also know that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Jesus. Secret follower. He was secret because he was afraid of being kicked out of the Sanhedrin. He was a secret follower because he was wealthy and connected and didn't want to lose that. He was secret because of his position, his status, and his influence. Didn't want to give that up. He was a secret follower right up until Jesus' crucifixion and death. When then, Joseph asked for Jesus' body. So he asked for Jesus' body. Now, his low-key approach was shattered when he requested the body of Jesus, because he and another guy named Nicodemus, who was also a Pharisee, uh, who was also part of the the council, uh, their devotion to Jesus was revealed by this surprise request. And they went to the governor, Pilate, who had authority over Jesus' body, and they said, can we have it? And he gave it to Joseph. And then Joseph did an amazing thing. He gave his new tomb to Jesus. Joseph gave his new tomb to Jesus. See, Joseph had the tomb carved out of the rock. I mean, that's what rich people did. Okay, only rich people could do this, by the way. Uh, And so he took his tomb that he had, had prepared for his own death, and he gave it to Jesus. He sacrificed his own tomb for Jesus' body, And then he sealed it with a stone, and it tells us that, you know, Mary Magdalene and Mary, probably the mother of Jesus, uh, were there, and they watched where it was so that they could return on Sunday and anoint the body. And of course, when they came Sunday, they found the empty tomb. Now, this is what we know about Easter Joseph. Just a, a little bit of information about an extremely crucial moment. Now, let's discuss what was significant about Joseph's actions. Why is this important? Uh, well, Why are Joseph's actions important enough to be mentioned in the gospel four different times? Uh, Does he really deserve the spotlight? I I mean, because after all, he was a secret disciple right up until Jesus' death. I want you to know that Joseph's actions were critically important. They were extremely important, uh, especially when we understand uh, what normally happens to a criminal's body after a crucifixion in the Roman Empire. So in first century Jerusalem, and and pretty much anywhere else the Romans were crucifying people, which was all over their empire, uh, most of the executed criminals, when they were taken down from their crosses, were just thrown on the trash heap and left for their bodies to be burned or for the dogs and vultures to eat them. That's pretty much what happened when you were a crucified criminal. I mean, think about it. Nobody else was there who could claim the body of Jesus. The disciples had fled in fear. They were hiding. 
Now, we know that the Apostle John and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were there, but they're from Galilee. They can't take a body and travel for days with a dead body and, and take it back home. They have no place to put it. So, what was going to happen to Jesus' body? Now do you see the significance of Joseph of Arimathea's action? Uh, if, if there's no place to put Jesus' body, then there's no tomb to find empty on Easter Sunday. If there's no tomb to put Jesus' body, then, then we don't have this, this celebration of, uh, oh, look, he, he was here and he was dead and he was laid in here and it was sealed and it was guarded and all of that. In other words, this helps to validate and create the story that we know as Easter. I mean, God used this secret disciple named Joseph of Arimathea that most people just read the name and not, never paid attention to, to establish the resurrection story that we know it. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. I think that's amazing when you look at this and, and you're going, yeah, that's pretty cool, but so what? So what? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? So let's talk about why it matters to us. Why does this matter to us? Because that's a great story, but what difference does it make to us 2,000 years later? What does God want to teach us and challenge us from this story? Well, here's, here's some reasons why Joseph's story matters to us. Uh, and, and I think that maybe you can relate to Joseph in some way in the story. First thing uh, that matters is Joseph was not a spiritual superstar. He was not a spiritual superstar. Notice he wasn't one of the 12. He, he never became a great teacher or apostle or preacher of the gospel. He, in fact, he's not mentioned again in Scripture. We, we never hear mention of him. He's never referred to. Uh, and after all, the Bible even calls him a secret follower. So why is that important? Because you may not feel like you're a spiritual superstar. You, you may not be in the spotlight or holding a mic or making a, a video sermon or, or worship, uh, leading people in worship. You, you may not be doing that. You may not be a preacher or a teacher or a missionary or even a deacon. You may even see yourself as a secret disciple or a quiet disciple and, and, and and yet, I want you to know that God can use you to change the world. He can use you to change the lives of other people. I, I really hope you can grasp this, but please understand, there are no unimportant followers of Jesus. There are no insignificant followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, because we're servants of God and every one of us has importance. I know this because the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we, followers of Jesus Christ, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you know what that means? That means that God knows you, God loves you, after all, He created you. God redeemed you by sacrificing Jesus on the cross for your sins. God adopted you into His family as a child of God. And God has things for you to do, specifically you. That they're not things that, that I'm supposed to do. They're not things that Pastor Joe's supposed to do. They're not things that the worship team's supposed to do. They are things that you are supposed to do for the kingdom of God. That is incredible. That is, that is wild when you think about it. God has something that you and you alone can do to make a difference in this world. I think that's incredible. So God can use your life to impact his kingdom. He's already designed a specific plan for you, and you don't need to be a superstar to do it. You just need to be available. So Joseph wasn't a spiritual superstar, and Joseph stepped up when everyone else ran away. You know, where were the uh, super spiritual, you know, soon-to-be apostles when Jesus died? They were hiding. They were afraid. They were afraid that the Romans were going to come and get them next, and they were going to get crucified as well. And yet Joseph, who was a secret disciple, courageously stepped up and cared for Jesus. He, he stepped up and did what nobody else was going to do. He did what God needed him to do. He responded to God's request of him. 
So what is God asking you to do? You know, I know you have lots of time to think right now, a lot more than maybe you want, because uh, you're, you, maybe you feel stuck at home. Maybe you're sitting there going, I don't know what to do next. I've already watched everything on Netflix, and I'm running out of stuff to do. Uh, if I have to watch Frozen 2 with my kids one more time, I'm, I'm going to go crazy. And, and you're kind of thinking, what's next? Here, here's a question I hope maybe you'll wrestle with. What does God want you to do? Because Joseph just did what God wanted him to do. What does God want you to step up for that other people are running away from? You know, is there a task is that no one else sees? Is there an opportunity that everybody else is blind to, and yet you're going, why aren't people doing this? Why can't someone do this? Because if that's on your heart, if that's in your mind, then you can do this. Maybe you are the only Christian that somebody knows. Ever think about that? And maybe right now they're terrified about what's going to happen next in the country with the illness, with the economy, with the world, and, and they are desperately seeking peace. And you, you might be a little nervous yourself, but you're like, hey, you know what? God still loves me and God's in control and I know I can trust God. And, and so I'm going to do that. But you can have an impact on their life, on their fear, on what they're worried about. Uh, it's, by the way, it's about three weeks till Easter. And uh, so what I was going to do is I was going to challenge you to invite your friends to come Easter because we had these nice, beautiful invite cards that we were going to put in your hands this weekend and say, hey, invite somebody that doesn't go to church to come to church with you. Uh, and honestly, we're not even sure we're going to be able to do church on Easter. Isn't that a crazy thought? Isn't that messed up? But anyway, that, that's the world we're living in. So how about this? How about share the link to our weekend services with somebody who's afraid, who doesn't know God? What if everybody who's a part of Calvary, and because I hope everybody who's a part of Calvary is watching this, but what if you all shared the link to this message and to all the messages that we're doing and to all the devotions that we're sharing throughout the week? What if you were those who are, who are spreading hope because you can do that? Because there's some people who don't really care who Chad Garrison is or what Chad Garrison thinks but they really do care about what you think and they know who you are and they trust you. And maybe it's this time, this opportunity that God's given us that none of us wanted, none of us saw coming. And, and maybe now it's time for us to be those unlikely witnesses in this moment. So Joseph wasn't a spiritual superstar. Joseph stepped up when everyone else ran away. And, and the third reason it matters is because Joseph sacrificed to honor Jesus. I mean, he risked his status, his position, and his reputation to honor Jesus. He gave up his tomb, paid for with his money, to honor Jesus. And he did that for a dead Messiah who had failed his followers as far as he could tell. He had no idea that Easter was coming. He had no idea about the resurrection. He had no idea what was next. But we do. We understand how this act of devotion, how this act of sacrifice, how this act of love for Jesus was redeemed by God to make a difference for, for all of us. So that on Easter morning, Mary would go to the tomb because she saw where he was laid and the stone would be rolled away and, and angels would appear and say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. And she would go tell the disciples and the disciples would come back and check and they would see the empty tomb and they would leave perplexed and then Jesus would appear to them and everything changes. We know the story, but Joseph didn't have a clue. He did not understand how his sacrifice to honor Jesus would be used by God to redeem literally billions of people from hell. You know, you know what he is? He's an unsung hero. He, he's, he's somebody that God used in an amazing way who, who, who wasn't a preacher, wasn't a teacher, wasn't all this kind of stuff, but he's an unsung hero because now, because of his actions, we all know salvation is available to everyone. Of course, Jesus doesn't lead a revolution against Rome. He completely defeats sin and death and hell and revolutionizes the world as we know it. Now, knowing that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, what will you do to honor Jesus? 
What will you do to honor Jesus? He doesn't need a tomb for a few days. That part's already been done for him. But what gift can you give him? What action can you take that's going to honor Jesus and make an eternal difference? Because the world we're living in right now is crazy. And, and, and I just got to tell you that the, the first application that, uh, that came to my mind when I wrote this sermon a couple of weeks ago was uh, the fact that, you know, Calvary has uh, a lot of needs, and there are some of you that are, are like Joseph of Arimathea, you know, you're rich and powerful, and, and maybe you can write a check and pay the debt off for the Sweetwater property, or maybe you can write a check and pay for a, a you know, building or property down in Parker so we can do some great things like that. And by the way, those are still needs, and those are still welcome. But the difference is, right now, you have an opportunity to change lives by your actions. I know we've all been hunkering down and we've all been, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to live life when we're isolated and we're socially distancing and what, what can I do, what can't I do, and are my kids going to be safe and are my parents going to be safe and are my grandparents going to be okay, and, and, and how am I going to make a living and how am I going to make a life and all of these things. And, and yet I'm just going to ask you, what does God want you to do that will honor Jesus that he can use to change the world? that he can use to change a life. It's, it can be as simple as this. How about being the person who speaks peace and calm into the fears of your family and friends? How about being the person who checks on your neighbors? Maybe you've got some elderly neighbors around you and, and you don't know them all that well or maybe you don't even like them. But Maybe you could go and just say, hey, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Can I go shopping for you? Can I get you things? Can I help you around the house? Is there some way that you need help? Because I would be glad to do that. Might start a conversation that, that leads to the why. Or, or maybe you know uh, a single mom. A single mom who has been working three jobs and two of them just got, you know, temporarily shut down. And she's terrified because she doesn't know how she's going to pay the rent and she doesn't know how she's going to pay the utilities, but you know that. And maybe you or maybe you and your life group or you and your friends can say, hey, you know what? Let's pay her rent for a month or let's buy her some groceries or, or hey, maybe you can do this. Maybe you know somebody who's desperate for toilet paper and you've been one of those people hoarding it. Yeah. What a great act of sacrifice right now is to offer up a pack of toilet paper to somebody who needs it. And you go, oh, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. It's demonstrating the love of Christ that because we love Jesus, because we want to honor Jesus, we think about other people before we think about ourselves. We realize that, that the gospel is so powerful that if we live it out as the church, it will transform our communities. You're saying, really? We can't even go to church. That's right. We can't go to church. But we are the church. Because Jesus Christ lives in you if you're a follower of Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he actually died on the cross and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow him, then the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and you are the church. We are the church. Whether we're gathered together or scattered, it doesn't matter. God is present, and God can use us to transform our communities of Lake Havasu City and Parker with the gospel of Jesus Christ if we will sacrifice to honor Jesus. Look around you. See the people. See the needs. If you can't do anything else other than walk your street and pray for the people in the houses around you, then do that. But if you can do what uh, one person, one family in our church I know did, they, they just made some cards and sent them to their neighbors and just said, if you need anything, ask. We'll shop for you. We'll go to the pharmacy for you. We'll do whatever you need. See, this is an opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and hopefully lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how we can be like Joseph of Arimathea because I want an army of unsung heroes here at Calvary. I want people going, wow, who are those Christians? Because of the way we love and the way we serve and the way we care. Now, there's one other way that... Uh, you can be like Joseph of Arimathea. And, and, uh, and that is this. Some of you are like Joseph in that up to this point, you have been secret disciples. 
you've been quiet followers. Maybe you've been coming when, when we can actually gather. Or maybe you've been watching. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever, you know, been a part of Calvary worship and, and, and you're watching this, uh, you know, online. And maybe you realize, hey, you know what? I believe in Jesus and I believe He's real and I believe He's the Son of God. I believe He died on the cross. But you know what? I've never made that commitment to follow Jesus. We're going to invite you today to do that in your home, where you are. Whether you're alone or with friends, all you have to do is say, okay, God, I surrender. Scripture says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Are you ready to make that commitment? Now, if you want to make that commitment, you want, then we want to know about it. Please email us at calvarylhc.com. Please call the church office. We'll get some materials to you. We'll, we'll uh, be glad to talk with you, and, and we want to hear about your decisions. And, and here's the thing. If you've been a secret disciple, you've been a follower of Jesus, but nobody knew about it, the way that we tell the world about that is baptism. It, it's declaring our, our, our love for Jesus by being publicly baptized uh, to let the world know we're unashamed followers of Jesus Christ. And if you... If you're a follower and you've never been baptized, then let me challenge you this way. Go ahead and commit to God and communicate with us that as soon as we're able to gather again in groups, you'll declare your faith in Jesus in baptism. You won't be a secret follower anymore. And just as Joseph was, you know, made public by his taking Jesus' body and putting it in his tomb, you can declare your love for Jesus publicly by getting baptized in his name. You see, the Easter story is one that is full of surprises and unlikely witnesses. Our story right now seems a lot like that. There's a lot of surprises. There's a lot of unlikely things going on. Let's be those people who are witnesses for the goodness of God and the grace of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for changing our lives through your love. And God, right now in this time of crisis and, and just uh, fear of uncertainty, I pray that you would give people peace. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that isn't connected to the circumstances. God, none of us are sure what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know this. We know that you love us. We know that you're with us and we know that you've promised us a place forever and ever that nothing can take away. A place without suffering or sorrow or death or pain. So fill us with that certainty of your love and your grace and our eternal life and help us to live differently because of it. Help us to love differently because of it. Help us to give differently because of it. Help us to treat our neighbors differently because of it. Because you are a great God and we want to live our lives to honor Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.